Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. And um, thanks, Kim, Sasha, and the, and the other uh, organisers of this uh, fantastic session for giving me the chance to say a few things about this wonderfully interesting part of the world, East Africa. So I thought before I hit anyone with a blizzard of um, seismological or tectonic detail that we might start with a simple topographic map. So long before we had any um, <clears throat> seismic tomographic images, let alone seismograph networks, um, we knew about these uplifted Ethiopian uh, and East African plateaus, in particular the East, the Ethiopian plateau, which of course is the home to the world's youngest continental flood basalt province. And the sort of high topography and the magmatism associated with these two zones has long been associated with the presence of one or more mantle plumes. So we'll 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 get stuck into that a little bit. Um, I'm going to focus in particular on mantle wave speed structure. There'll be a little bit of overlap with. Um, uh, some stuff that uh, Rita Canudis uh, listed down here with the, um, the co-authors here, talked about just a few weeks ago. We'll also talk about some work that my fantastic former PhD student, Alistair Boyce, did looking at whole mantle uh, seismic structure and also at the mantle uh, transition zone structure um, below, below this region. So to, just to throw a little bit more detail there, um, we, when we start to think about the Takala depression, we've got to remember that we are not looking at a simple situation, we're looking at multiple rifts superimposed on each other. This uh, region may now be a zone of East African rifting. Here we've got the Eastern and Western rifts um, uh, uh, splitting around the Tanzanian crater. I'm looking at the main Ethiopian rift up here marks the East African rift in Ethiopia. But in these pastel shades here, what you can see are the so-called Anza Rift. So this was a, a Mesozoic phase of rifting. We know that it failed, but it uh, left us with some very deep sedimentary basins and uh, pro almost certainly uh, a very heavily thinned crust um, below this region, which probably explains the low-lying nature of the region. There's always been these nagging doubts as to whether the low-lying nature of the Tacoma depression could be exclusively explained by, by a thin crust rather than a lack of buoyant dynamic support from below. So we'll, we'll, we'll get stuck in a little bit to that. One of the reasons that this region has been intriguing over the years is a lack of broadband seismic station coverage. So in these, on the right hand side here, what you can see in each of these blue dots is a broadband um, seismograph station. So these were never in, uh, all installed at the same time, but uh, been uh, installed over the last sort of two to three decades um, as temporary seismograph networks on both the uplifted Ethiopian and East African plateaus. But always missing in this story was the um, the Tikana Depression. And what you can see here in these yellow dots are the stations of the so-called trails network. So this was the Tikana Rift Arrays investigating uh, lithospheric structure which uh, Cindy Evinger at, um, at Tulane University uh, sort of spearheaded getting this project up and running. She'd been wanting to get into the Tacana Depression with a bunch of seismometers for a long time. So this NERC, uh, so NSF NERC, um, uh, US, UK led project has, has let us record all these data. Before COVID, we got everything into the ground and then we were lucky slash unlucky, depending on how you look at it. Um, by the fact that COVID meant we had to keep recording for a long time because we weren't allowed in to pull any of our instruments out of the ground. Anyway, focus uh, just very quickly on the images in the in the centre of the screen. The, the the picture that very quickly comes out of analysing these data from the Tacoma Depression, um, before we get too deep in the mantle, the picture that comes out here, if we look at both uh, HK stacking of trustal um, work from Chris Ogden, remember that's what these dots here are showing, that's the MOHO depth. Uh, the pink line is a, an inferred from a velocity proxy estimate of the MOHO depth from Rita Canudis' surface wave work. And the striking observation here, the first one you can see is you've got a markedly thinned crust. The Ethiopian rift to the north had a, a very low uh, beta stretching factor, that's an initial ratio of initial to final trustal thickness, whereas in the main Ethiopian rift it was about 1.12. Here in Takana, it's much higher. It's about 2.11. So we've got a, a much, much more evidence for basin forming um, faults and probably uh, crustal stretching has given rise to this. The second really striking observation are the wave speeds. 
If I was to show you a similar image from the main Ethiopian rift to the north, what you'd see are significantly uh, warmer colours if I was using the same colour scheme. So whilst we're looking here at um, wave speeds uh, that are generally above 4.2 kilometres per second, we might describe that in the global sense as normal to almost fast. The wave speed structure below the, the lithosphere, below the, um, the, the Moho, and the lithospheric mantle of the main Ethiopian rift and plateau to the north is extremely slow. We're talking about much less, even less than four kilometers per second. So we're getting this picture, we've got very different styles of, um, of extension, different impact of magnetism on, um, on the lithosphere. Uh, these areas that we're labeling as RML, refractory mantle lithosphere, we're, we're suggesting that these are areas that have almost resisted rifting altogether. Not surprising under the Tanzanian crater, of course, but when you get below the Tikana Depression and other parts of southern Ethiopia, these were not what we expected to see in an area where, just to, to repeat what I said a few minutes ago, um, to the north of here, we've got this idea of um, uh, magma-assisted rifting and large amounts of lower crustal intrusions that have really quite heavily modified the uh, the crust and mantle lithosphere, all right? So we're painting this picture that it's kind of depression is something different, very different styles of extension uh, and, and magnetism impact on the, on the lithosphere there. Something that Rita Canidis um, did a really good job of presenting a few weeks ago um, in this same session was was her attempts to try and understand the lithosphere as the atmosphere boundary. Now, often you'll see people use uh, S to P receiver functions where we look for a uh, conversion of, of a P, P wave to a shear wave from the base of the lithosphere. And that conversion is almost completely absent from the main Ethiopian rift to the north, that area where we've got lots of magnetism. And that sort of makes sense when we look at these 1D velocity profiles. This one here is from the heart, sort of an, an average profile from the Ethiopian plateau further north here, from Mulugeta Dugda's joint inversion of receiver functions and surface waves a few years ago. And what's lacking here, what you can't see, is an obvious distinction between a fast wave speed lithosphere and a low wave speed asthenosphere. Normally you would want to look at a profile like this and say, well, okay, I can see the distinction here between lithosphere and the stenosphere, that, that, that distinction is totally gone. The lithosphere itself is almost certainly um, slow uh, uh, in nature compared to the global average. That's the AK135 dash line there, that would be the global average. So the Tacona depression, we see, we very quickly start to see evidence in, in, in different parts of the, of the depression that you've got a much more characteristic wave speed structure. These yellow bars here are showing you the sort of regional average within each zone. So see there you've got multiple seismograph stations contributing to this mean profile. But the, the lithosphere is relatively quick. Okay, and we saw that just in the slide earlier when uh, in, in Rita's surface wave work. Um, and that contrasts with a you know, very slow wave speed as thenosphere at depth. Okay. So this is this is rather consistent with the observations that we saw we saw earlier, where the low crustal VPVS was telling us that we got um, very low. Uh, involvement of melt in the extensional process. And notice too, actually, I, I should have pointed this out earlier, notice how gradational the, the Moho transitions here below the Ethiopian plateau to the north. You've got this very grad gradational, gradual change from crustal wave speeds to mantle wave speeds. And if I just go back a slide to here, that's because of this area here, this magnetic underplate, all right? So this 7.38 kilometer per second layer in wide angle seismic data, is neither characteristically crust nor mantle. And that, that's the sort of thing that's turning up here. We don't see this abrupt change from crust to mantle velocities. That, this, that evidence for lower crustal intrusions is comparatively lacking pretty much everywhere below the Tacana depression. Consistent with that, the northern end of Lake Tacana, which is the one place that we do have some wide angle seismic data, um, there's almost no evidence for uh, lower crustal intrusions, a traditional called underplay in the literature. Okay, so we can we can really um, we can use these types of images to, to we can either use a velocity proxy to pull out an estimate for the seismic LAB. We might be picking out our, a steep gradient. Um, the maximum gradient here in wave speed is our mechanism for, for for estimating the thickness of the lithosphere. Alternatively, we can convert these wave speeds to temperature, and you can either look at a typically the section of your your, your temperature profile. Um, will change in its gradient from conductive to convective mantle. You can either take that sort of intersection of those two broad gradients there to pick out an LAB, 
Or you could take a, another proxy, for example, where your temperature profile crosses something like the 1350 degrees C adiabat. So either way, the point is below the Takana depression, you end up with a relatively similar story, to whether or not you pick the thermal NAB, in this case using 1350, or whether you use the seismic NAB. Okay, so we're definitely looking at a plate uh, based on the lithosphere that's not been obliterated by melt in quite such uh, extent as the area uh, to the north of it. You're nearing well, just... the 10-minute mark. Okay. Five minutes. okay, so let's try and think about why that might be. So I'm going to report here a little bit on Alistair Boyce's excellent work in G-cubed on the uh, mantle transition zone structure and deep mantle seismic structure. So um, each of these points here, the blues are the seismic stations, and these have given rise to lots of piercing points at the uh, 410 and 660 discontinuity. So this gives us an idea about how well we can now sample the mantle transition zone. Why do we care about the mantle transition zone? Well, the opposite Clapeyron slopes of the Olivine to Wadsleyite and um, Ringwoodite to Perovskite, uh, transitions that cause the 410 and 660 uh, respectively. Because of these op opposite slopes, we can use, if we can measure the depths uh, to the 410 and 660 using receiver functions, we can look at anomalies in the uh, transition zone depth to try and use this effectively as a, as a thermometer for the mantle. A slightly surprising observation here was that the hottest mantle, according to uh, this uh, continent-wide uh, compilation of um, uh, transitions of thickness estimates, was not actually below the Ethiopian flood basalt province shown here in magenta, but actually below the northern end of Lake uh, Takana and almost below part of the Tanzanian crater. So this was this was sort of not what we'd expected. We'll, we'll come back to this image, taking into account the movement, the northward motion of the African plate in just a few minutes. Um, the second challenge that we were able to tackle by having all of these extra seismic stations below the Tacoma Depression, of course, is we can start to expand global tomographic models or constant scale tomographic models. Um, I don't want to spend too long on this, but typically when you've got a regional seismograph network, you'll do, use something called relative arrival times. And that means you'll, you'll align peaks and troughs of um, coherently arriving energy from across a network. And you'll say, uh, You'll use that to produce a tomographic model that tells you um, which areas of your model are relatively fast and relatively slow. The problem with this is that each relative arrival time model has a different background mean. Very difficult to compare, for example, an image from Ethiopia with Southern Africa in that case, because zero is kind of different amongst all these things. So what you really want to do is get hold of the first breaking energy. And that's what this work here, I'm not I'm running out of time if I'm not careful, but basically using the this method called ARM that Alistair Boyce developed, you can utilize the coherence of these um, regional networks, such as trails, form a stack, go back to the unfiltered domain and actually pick out the first break of energy from your, from your stack that comes out really nicely. So we're then able to present um, the first um, big tomographic models um, from a P-Wave perspective for East Af the whole of East Africa that incorporate data from the Takana Depression. There's an awful lot of stuff here that you uh, have seen before. Nothing should come as a surprise to some level. So the, the African super plume here, we can see rising from the core mantle boundary below Southern Africa and rising towards Ethiopia um, and Southern Kenya and uh, Northern Kenya up here. One thing that did turn out to be quite new, and you can read more about this in Alistair's uh, GQ paper, is this uh, new uh, plume tail that we observed in Southwest Ethiopia, if you if you're, if you're willing to believe that that's uh, potential evidence for a plume and tail. And it, it turns out that, that that is directly below some of the earliest magnetism in East Africa. However, however, let's have a think about where this plate was at 30 million years ago. So we were surprised, well, I presented it as a surprise that the flood basalt province was forming not actually above the thinnest and therefore arguably the hottest transition zone in East Africa. If you um, follow the G plates model, take um, take the flood basalt province back uh, 30 million years and place it to where it was at the, when the most effusive eruptions, the most voluminous eruptions were occurring, you end up with the flood basalt province sitting much more nicely over this area of extremely thin transition zone. So, um, despite the fact that the petrologists would um, uh, quite reasonably say that there are no variations in mantle potential temperature estimated from uh, Cenozoic lavas through time, it does appear um, that perhaps the, the primary plume impact on the base of the plate um, would have been where the Ethiopian flood basalt province is now. If that, that may have been associated with this thin transition zone and that new plume tail, plume C, uh, 
uh, that we that we highlighted here. Okay. Um, so I presumably don't have very much time. But I'll wrap up as quickly as I can. So the Tacoma depression lithosphere is certainly an awful lot less uh, modified by Cenozoic magnetism than Ethiopia to the north. Both in terms of uh, wave speeds, the style of rifting is mechanical rather than magmatic. We saw with the lithosphere as the atmosphere boundary, we can see it much more clearly as a fast wave speed lid contrasting uh, slow wave speed as the atmosphere to depth. And um, the Tacoma depression with the spheric thickness, actually, if we were to, to look at stretching factors, you probably, there's a lot of games you've got to play about what the starting thickness uh, actually is. But um, the, it, it turns out that the stretching factors for the man, for the lithospheric mantle are actually pretty similar to the crustal stretching factors. So mechanical, not magmatic extension uh, has been dominating at least until um, about one or so million years ago below, uh, below the depression. And the Deep mantle, if you're prepared to believe these um, transition zone images, may hold the key to that. So at 30 million years ago, the flood basalt problems arguably overlay what was what we think may have been the, the hottest mantle. And that may therefore explain the, the marked difference in uh, lithospheric seismic structure between the Ethiopian plateau and the rift and the and the Tacana depression just a little further south. Um, I think I'm probably out of time, but I could leave you with a very nice summary uh, from Rita Canudis' um, PhD thesis, really trying to draw this, um, this contrast between um, a heavily mel melt-infiltrated central and northern main Ethiopian rift with a very uncertain lithosphere and hemisphere boundary with a much more melt-poor um, um, kind of depression further south. But I wasn't going to show that slide, which is why it says blank, but I'm, I'm finished now anyway. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ian. That's great. Um, lovely talk, lovely visuals. Um, we we started a wee bit late, but we probably have time for one, maximum two short questions. If anybody's got any questions, if you can put your hand up or um, just type something in the chat. Uh, Kathy Whaler's got a question. Go ahead. Hey, Kathy. You you you've cited the Dugto et al. where you don't see the very clear lab. Um, is that true? I don't know if you've been able to look at stations on the eastern side of the Ethiopian of the rift in Ethiopia where you don't have the underplate. Um, not quite. I mean, the closest we were able to get, I guess, would be. I can go into reverse here. Oh, slides are too big. Uh, the closest we were able to get come on, um, would be, I suppose, zone C here, where an observation I didn't highlight actually, but in Alistair's, um, in ARFRP22, the new tomographic model, this area down here was actually seismically fast in the, in the tomographic model. Uh, which coincidentally is not flood basalt capped, right? So we, I mean, actually the, the refraction profile goes further north, so I can't say for sure whether there's no magmatic underplate there. But that's what the that's what the lid looks like. So we certainly look as though we've got um, a fast wave speed lithosphere consistent with actually what was seen in the, in the, uh, in the tomography in a couple of slides later. And actually, I probably would uh, hit out and say, there isn't any evidence for underplate there because we've got a much sharper looking moho uh, than you see below the plateau on the western side where we... Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly that's what we saw in the MT result when we did that along the Eagle profile as well, that you couldn't see any evidence for underplate on the Somalian plateau side. Yeah. Just wondering if you've been able to update those type of, that type of information. Thanks. That was the, sorry, very quickly, that was the fast wave speed zone of lithosphere Mm. It's probably smeared right in this global. In yeah, and we'd have been looking further north, but yeah, that's probably some kind of refractory lithospheric block that perhaps has governed the the development of uh, the Anza Rift because that that marks the northern limit of Anza there. Okay, thanks. Sasha's also got a question. Is it insanely quick? Uh, well, how confident are you about this plume tail in the lower mantle? Uh, what's the resolution uh, of the of the data set? How how well how much would you bet on it that it's actually there? Um, seismic tomography is always paint by numbers, and it's paint by uncertain numbers. It's not um, 
no one else has quite had the data to confirm this. So if I was going to be a real skeptic, which I am, um, I'd want to see other people use other tomographic imaging techniques. We wouldn't have talked about it um, if we didn't think we got the best. We have tested it, um, and we, you know, we. I'll, I'll leave it to you to assess um, the resolution tests. They're all laid out in the Boyce et al. 2023 paper. We wouldn't talk about it if we didn't absolutely uh, think it was there. But I, I think it'll be good to see other people try and retrieve this using um, using their different tomographic methods, surface waves as well as body waves. Great. Thanks.